Hello, everyone. This is Ed Brenniger, and welcome to the Eddie Network podcast. And my guest today is Steve Ware. And Steve is, is in the midst of something which many of us have gone through, you know, where you reach mid career and all of a sudden you see things changing. And that it's an exciting thing. It really is. And, um, and when I had my a con early conversation with Steve, I thought, wow, this is, this is really fantastic. So I'm glad he's here today. Glad you're here, Steve. And Pleasure. so um, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're up to today. Yeah, so I'm Steve Ware. I'm from the other side of the pond. I'm from a place called Portsmouth in the south of England. And I guess I guess the best way of phrasing it Ed, is to say that I'm I'm probably the least likely mindfulness teacher you'll ever meet. And <laughs> I like that. There's a bigger story to that which we can get into. Yeah. But the, you know the transition for me, the the shift of of roles, which was pretty dramatic, right? I went from from a huge corporate IBM. You know, I joined IBM when I was eighteen, just a young kid, and I stayed almost thirty years. And then when I lost my job there three years ago during COVID, um, I made a huge shift. I came out of corporate. I set my own business up, my own wellness business. Um, and it was a kind of it was a kind of a story that really spanned ten years. So. Um, you know, whilst I was still at IBM, I started the transition. It wasn't like I lost my job and then kind of stopped and went, okay, what do I want to do next? I kind of found myself inadvertently kind of preparing for the next stage of my life, I think, whilst at IBM. But it's a funny story because I, yeah, I, I never, I would guess I could describe it as mindfulness found me rather than me finding mindfulness, if that makes any sense. I I didn't wake up one day and think, do you know what, I want to be a mindfulness teacher. Um for the main reason I thought mindfulness was a lot of BS. I, I thought it was new age, navel gazing. I thought it was yeah, um, not something for me, you know, this kind of macho professional in a, in a huge American corporate that had a lot of stuff to do and had a lot of clients to keep happy. And um, so it was a massive shock to me that mindfulness was helpful and that it was something that I could integrate to my life and that it was just this normal mainstream thing it was it was as normal as just going to the gym it's as normal as eating healthy food it's as normal as brushing your teeth this is this is it can become part of the pantheon of good things that we all do so so what define mindfulness for us that's a good question so whenever anybody asks me that so there's a standard answer most uh, if you google what is mindfulness i reckon google's probably a top pick well i haven't done it recently but Google's top answer would probably be from an American called John Kabat-Zinn, who's a brilliant man. He pretty much was a pioneer of bringing mindfulness to the West. Uh, he did it in, in Boston, Massachusetts, late 70s, early 80s. He founded a program called Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, which is still taught now. It's a fabulous program. <clears throat> and he would probably define it, I'm paraphrasing because I've not memorized it deliberately, but something like mindfulness is paying attention in the present moment, non-judgmentally, and then there's another bit I can't remember at the end. And the reason I don't ever define mindfulness, even, even if I'm doing a keynote or even if I'm teaching courses, is because I want mindfulness to be something that you know and that you can relate to in your life, Ed. I don't want it to be this clever definition definition from John Kabat-Zinn or from Oxford or from Harvard or from, or from anywhere else. Because clever definitions are great. They have their place. But for me, they only become meaningful when... They describe something that you've directly experienced and you go, ah, yes, I know what that is. So I still haven't answered your question, though. So what is mindfulness? To me, I would I would flip it back on somebody and I'd say, well, Ed and everybody listening, think, think about one moment in your life, whether it was this morning, 20 years ago, when you were five years old, doesn't matter. One moment where you felt just a moment of peace, so just you know, if I could make a sound to describe it, it'd probably be just kind of, ah, oh, life's good. That kind of exhale, life's good, right? The weight of the world lifts from your shoulders, your shoulders come down. Wow, beautiful, I can breathe. So just one moment like that, and I don't want to put too many ideas in people's head. Maybe they're on holiday somewhere. Maybe they were playing with their baby. Maybe they were stroking their dog. Maybe they were, maybe they were doing something intensely alive. Maybe they were skiing down a mountain, racing a bike, climbing something. Athletes will call this flow state. Or maybe they were just noticing the incredible beauty in something, maybe a sunrise or sunset. They just stopped them for a second. 
And what I'd say to them is zoom all the way in. This is where you need to be very um, deliberate. Zoom all the way in. And if you look at the moment that felt truly peaceful, not a second before it or a second after it, but during that brief, may have been a second, may have been less, may have been a few seconds of feeling that peace, that intense joy, that aliveness, really noticing that beauty, I'd say to them, how much thinking were you doing? And the answer that everyone says, or most people say, is none. My mind was still. And when they make that connection, that the most beautiful moments in their life, whether they're active, whether they're sitting still somewhere, whether they're truly noticing the beauty of something, they notice that that incess otherwise incessant voice in their head, the noise-making machine in the head that we all have, this thinking mind that's non-stop, when that shuts the hell up for just a second, it does not feel good. In fact, it feels like the best moments you've ever had in your life. And whether that's sitting in a bar, tasting a beautiful drink, or, or having a beautiful meal that you paid a lot of money for, you naturally are present because you want to taste it because you paid big money for it. Or whether it's just staring into the night sky and for two seconds, you just forget all your problems because your mind stops completely because there's such a beautiful, vast spaciousness there and you connected that. So that's mindfulness to me. It, They're the most beautiful moments in our life. Uh, hearing you hearing you say that, describe it that way, it, it feels like you're talking about being able to um, get out of your head and be in your body. That yeah. this, this is a form of embodiment. Right. You're, you're, embo you're, you're embodied and the world is indwelling within you and you are one in a sense with the world. Absolutely. That's a nice description. And there's a great book by John kabat I mentioned, and, you, and the title of the book is Coming, Coming to Your Senses, Coming to Our Senses. Mm -hmm. when you, when, when you, whenever you place all of your attention in your sense perceptions, truly smelling something, truly tasting, truly listening, mm -hmm. truly touching, or if you just place your attention on your breath and really notice the sensation coming in, the coolness as you breathe in, you could do it right now. Track, track your breath just for two breaths. If everyone listened to this, tracks their breath for two breaths. And what I mean by track your breath, I mean dial up your alertness level right now. Because this isn't this isn't a chilling out, zoning out, falling below thinking thing. This right. is becoming alert and alive and awake. So turn up your alertness levels right now and catch the next breath as it comes in and follow it. Follow the wave of that breath with your attention. So just kind of piggyback it. And for me, I'll describe it out loud just to maybe help all people. So as cool as I breathe in, I can notice the coolness right at the tip of my nose. It goes past my throat. I need to be very alert to sense that because you don't normally, you normally tune out to that, but I can tune into it if I'm careful. My chest raises very slightly. My abdomen raises quite noticeably. It touches my t-shirt. And then it falls away and the breath comes back up and out. Mm -hmm. And if you watch your breath, this is, this is a radical thing, but people don't realize it. Anytime you watch your breath, Ed, Anytime you truly place your attention on the sensation of breath entering and leaving your body, your mind will be completely still because you can't do both those things at the same time. So if we feed that back into my definition of mindfulness, if mindfulness is the most beautiful moments in your life, where your mind's still, where you're present, where you're embodied, and we can create that now, we can either create it by literally coming to our senses. If we stood in the shower, we can we can place as much of our attention as we can into you know, smelling the smells, feeling the warm water, really being present there, feeling myself standing. But it's also very accessible because it's just a breath away. So when you're stuck at your red traffic light, you can become present. You can stop your mind. The red traffic light will stop your car. It can also stop your mind. And it can stop your mind if you just take one or two conscious breaths. This sounds very much like... Um what the uh, uh, great chemist and philosopher of science, Michael Polioni, speaks of as tacit knowledge. And he distinguishes between tacit knowledge, which is the, the, the knowledge that we, we know, but we don't know how we know it, and right. the rational knowledge, which is always present in our minds. And, we're, and, it, and that rational knowledge is a sense of trying to gain some kind of control over the world. Yeah. Or circumstances mm -hmm. and and i think that's where the and i'm you, you correct me if i'm wrong about this but i think it's that a that trying to control um the world 
and our place in it, which is where the stress comes from yeah. and where our our uh, loss of our loss of control actually comes. Yeah. And, and that is you can let that go. Absolutely. And yeah. just kind of be in touch with your senses. Absolutely. And, and uh, we're in, that's the way it is. I and mean, that's the way you get there. Yeah. And we're in control of very little when we think about it. You know, we think just because we've set up insurances and we've got this and we've got that, that we're really controlling loads of things. But I mean, we don't even control our own body, do we? I mean, I'm not I'm not breathing here. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. not beating my heart. I'm not circulating my blood. I'm not digesting food. I'd go one further. This is maybe a bit deep for an initial podcast, but I'd also say I'm not thinking. I'm being thought. Yeah. There's all this, there's all these, um, there's a vast intelligence in our body. There's in, these incredible things happening. Um, but we think as humans, we have this tendency to think just because we've got this human mind that sets us apart from other species and is a phenomenal thing. I'm not knocking it at all. It's not the enemy. But for most people, their, their thinking mind um, is all there is. And, and when you can go from When you can go from looking through your mind to at your mind, the world changes. And if you can go from being used by your mind to using your mind, the world changes. So let's let's take this to a philosophical level. So this sounds to me like you're taking, you're flipping or reversing what we have um, believed since the dawn of the Enlightenment, which is cartesian rationalism which is i think therefore i am mm. and you're flipping that and and you're i think what you're saying is i am therefore i think yeah that would be that would be a better description i think because i think is a very is, people get hung up on this and people will challenge this and say well, no, I am control. I'm, I'm absolutely in control of my thinking, Steve, because I can think about what I have for breakfast this morning. I can think about what I'm going to do later. I can channel my thinking here. I can solve this problem. I can, and of course we can do that in the same way we can influence our breath. I can hold my breath. I can make it deeper. I can make it more shallow. But if we were truly in control, if we, if, if we were truly in control of all of, the, all of our thoughts, there'd be no medication for anxiety or depression or anything else because... You go into a doctor's office and say, I'm anxious, I can't stop worrying about stuff, or I'm depressed, I can't stop it. And your doctor would say to you, Well, you, you know, you're you're thinking every thought in your head. Just cut out the anxious ones. Just cut out the sad ones. I mean, yeah. can you imagine? That's this very irresponsible thing to say. So we've got this mind that has a mind of its own, and yet we can somehow find a place beyond that, a stillness beyond that. And we can learn not to get up in, caught, caught up in constant thinking, not to be constantly consumed by this thinking mind. There's a place of stillness that you can step out of and observe this thinking mind from. And that's a beautiful place to dwell in. And you can use your body to do that, like we said earlier. So so how have you taken this, this perception of the world, perception of reality, and applied it in, in, the, in the world? In, in the world of business or in, in the world of of clients and people and how do you, what do you, what is it that you're doing to take this this thing that you've acquired this gift or whatever i don't know i don't know the right word for it but it's it's something like that i mean yeah. it's like you've been given something that you're giving away in a sense yeah yeah uh, so how are you doing that what's what are the things that you do on a daily basis that allows this um idea about mindfulness to be shared with the world i guess my i guess my journey my typical journey with a corporate would be that they would have some level of interest in mindfulness mm -hmm. and you know whether they look at google who've been doing this since 2008 or salesforce or ibm or you know there's, there's countless big um big corporates that have been getting huge roi from mindfulness programs so typically i would typically i would start the best way to do it is to go in and to have an hour's keynote, masterclass, whatever you want to call it. And in that masterclass, Ed, you, I would really get people to, it'd be pretty much like what we're talking about here, right? So people would say, what the hell is mindfulness? 
And when they get to the point where they go, okay, well, mindfulness was that time when I was skimming, I'm on holiday, all the greatest moments. And they sit a little bit forward in their chair and go, well, I'm interested in this guy now. Because if he can give me more of these moments, I don't have those moments apart from the two week vacation. I'm stressed out 50 weeks of the year. I go on holiday for two weeks. I just about calm down. And then I have to get worked up and come back. And I'm checking my mail when I'm on holiday anyway. So if you can help me integrate this into my life right now, this moment, um, and, and you're telling me I don't need to postpone my happiness to when all my problems are solved, when my health's good, when my finances are perfect, when everything's brilliant in the world, or when I retire. You know, we're constantly postponing our happiness, aren't we? Even if it's to the end of the day, I can't wait for work to finish, I can get a drink. I can't wait to the weekend. I can't wait to the next vacation. I can't. So if we, can, if we can forget all that and realize that, you know, essentially the only, the only ever moment we have is this one, you know, what happened yesterday, I can only recall as a memory and what's going to happen tomorrow, I can only project as a, as a kind of idea in my head. But the only thing that's actually real is here, right? Because when tomorrow comes, it's the present moment again. And when I think about yesterday, I can only think about it in the present moment. Mm-hmm. The present moment is all there is. I mean, if people, if people think that sounds like a crazy thing, then come to my bar, um, which I'm going to buy, and I'm going to put a big sign above it, and I'm going to say, free beer tomorrow, Ed. <laughs> You can have as many as you want. But it's tomorrow. That's tomorrow. Tomorrow, right? So come back tomorrow, and then you'll come back tomorrow. And I say, no, Ed, it's tomorrow. Free bit tomorrow, not now. So yeah, I like that. You know, these, these are all silly things, and they and they sound flippant, and they sound like we should just laugh and throw them away. But we're living our lives consumed by these things, by these goalposts that are ne- that never stop moving. And so I would typically go into a corporate, and we talk about all this, and it's pretty fun. It can be a really fun discussion. But essentially what I'm doing is I'm shifting people from the conceptual knowing of what mindfulness is to the experiential knowing. Because a great mantra, nobody ever got fit by listening to a talk on fitness. Nobody ever became more mindful, very few, um, just by listening to a keynote, no matter how fantastic it is on mindfulness. So the the big, biggest mistake businesses make is they think they can transform their organization with mindfulness, either by giving everyone access to an app and if you look at the stats on that in terms of people who download it, use it, still using it three, six, 12 months later, the stats aren't brilliant. Or they think even worse, they think they'll get a speaker in and they'll, they'll do an hour's talk and then we can tick that box. Like it's a bit of healthy safety and training kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Box. Yeah. So what I do is show people that that can be a great introduction to mindfulness. That can give you the filter job where you find the people in your organization who want to do this, you know, who are interested in this. And then I take them on a gold standard eight week journey, which is which is based on a fabulous course from the University of Oxford here in England. It was the program I taught in IBM before I left. It was the first and only corporate uh, mindfulness approved program there. And it's only it's eight sessions. It's 19 minute sessions uh, once a week. So we only get together a total of 12 hours over two months. But it's very skillfully put together and it shows you loads of different ways of achieving mindfulness in your life. It gives you loads of different doorways into the same room. And the biggest thing it gives you, Ed, which is the biggest blocker, right? Because if someone out there is listening, they may think, Steve, it sounds all right. But you know what? I don't even have time for lunch break. So I don't have time to listen to your 90 minute webinar once a week. And I certainly don't have time to practice for what you're going to tell me to practice for half an hour a day. I just don't have the time. I've got so much to do. I've got so Okay, I accept that. And I certainly accept that in business. I did almost 30 years in IBM and that. So we need to mitigate that. And the way to do that is by realizing that there's actually nothing you do in a formal practice of meditation that you can't do in the rest of your life. And that's not about doing different things. It's about doing things differently. What the hell does that mean? That means that you can apply the same principles of a meditation whilst you're in the shower, whilst you're brushing your teeth whilst you're drinking your wine, whilst you're having your breakfast, whilst you're doing some, putting the trash out, doesn't even need to be anything interesting. And when you do that, when you start to sprinkle your day, your life with mini moments of space is essentially what you're doing. You're stilling your mind just for a second. So you go from having a a day of pretty much nonstop thinking, your foot's on the gas all day. There's very little space. You never step out and ground yourself, resource yourself. When you pepper your day with these little moments, cumulative effect is huge. In the same way that that guy, the US guy who ate McDonald's every day, was it for 30 days? Um, he showed us the power of cumulative effect, didn't he? Because yeah. you eat McDonald's one day, I go to my doctor and I say, how do, my, how do my blood results look? And he says, you're good, you're fine. Livers look good, blood's good. 
if I eat it all day, every day for 30 days, this guy showed us, okay, your enzymes in your liver, that they, they, they've changed and your cholesterol's gone up and X, Y, Z's gone up. So the power is in the cumulative effect. This isn't, mindfulness is, is something that you need to think of like fitness. You don't complete it. I'm not going to complete being fit. I'm not going to complete eating healthy meals. I'm not going to complete dental hygiene. This, this ideally becomes part of the pantheon of good things you do hopefully every day, but maybe several days a week. And when you can integrate it in your routine and it, and it becomes part of your routine without too much of an effort and without you needing to invest a lot of time, uh, it's fabulous because that changes the game. You feel better. That boosts your motivation to do it. And it's just a really nice circle to be in. So help me to be clear about this. So there is there is a uh, a discipline that's involved here mm. and and we could be, get focused on the discipline the yeah. do, the doing of this yeah instead of the being of this ah yeah and and so that you see i think that's the that's the um that's the threshold that most people uh have a hard time crossing over so it's you know it's like the door is open and it's beckoning you to cross into the new the, to, to the next room but you know it, even in your uh, misery there's a something comfortable about it because it's right. it's already known yes so when when you were let go by ibm three years ago mm -hmm. that was that that could have been a moment of <gasps> You know, where you begin to focus on, oh, no, what am I going to do now? Yeah. But I take it that that's not what happened. You you did something different. So what yeah. what was it? I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm really kind of wanting to uh, dig a little deeper into this idea of how mindfulness can help us when we're in transition. Yeah. Great question. I remember someone... I got to know in, in IBM and in, in the US and HR. And she said to me, she found out I was being made redundant. And she said to me, because they gave me three months notice, so I was speaking to a lot of people. And she said, what has mindfulness meant to you during this? Mm -hmm. Global pandemic, unprecedented pandemic. I've just lost my job. I'd never lost my job before that. Ed. You know, I've, I've been working since I was a kid, even just in the local, um, you know, clothing shop and stuff. And then, and then I joined IBM at 18. So I'd never not worked. I'd never had a month in my life where I didn't earn some money. And then suddenly they, this is looming. And when she said to me, what does mindfulness mean to you at a time like this? Before I could even formulate, I just regurgitated this word that just came without me even thinking. It just said everything. Uh, and I said it before I even realized I'd said it. And I kind of, as I, as I said the word everything, I thought, did I mean to say that? What does that mean? And I tell you what it means, because I mean, and you can only kind of speculate, right? Because I, I wouldn't, I can never go back and repeat what happened to me without having the mindfulness practice behind me. Um, but based on me knowing me for kind of forty-five years up to that point, that would have scared the hell out of me. I mean, the fear of the unknown is huge. I'm a massively risk-averse person. I'm not a businessman. I'm not an entrepreneur. Um, I'm not somebody who takes risk. I'm somebody who works with big companies and gets a safe paycheck and gets healthcare and gets Spanish pension and all this kind of stuff. And so, you know, when I'm sitting there with, with a huge decision, the biggest, biggest decision in my life, do I go back into what I know I'm good at and, and, and in quote, safe? Uh, it, was a, it was a real head v. heart decision. And head screaming, corporate, safe job, get your pension, get your benefits back, get everything back in as quick as you can, we need a paycheck. Because IBM, by the way, IBM gave me about, I mean, in dollars, it would be about $15,000 for, for 28 years service. I didn't have a big cushion financially. And the heart was saying, Steve, you know what to do here. Is it scary? Hell yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah. But it's a different kind of fear, Ed. It's the fear you get before you go on a roller coaster. It's an excited, anticipatory geez, can I do this? I was going to scare the hell out of me, but yeah, I'm going to want to get on it. I'm going to get on. Versus if you hate public speaking, that paralyzing fear of 
this is a fate worse than death i'm shutting down this is awful so it was a, it was a a more comfortable fear that i could lean into but i had no clue could i set a business up where am i going to find clients how am i going to make enough money to live i'm running out of money i've never done this before you know a thousand questions i could run through that would be um, all the fears that are spinning through my mind so so the mindfulness helps me in that moment to practically see those thoughts not necessarily believe them know that they're not absolutely true in that moment they're just the mind doing its thing and to come back to the reality of the present moment which is what okay i don't have a job fine i have this amount of money set aside here's what i want to do can i make a plan who can i reach out to who can i phone who can i how can i set the website up how can i start making this business a reality that's really what it is the rest is noise the rest is chatter the rest is catastrophizing and worrying always implies future a future which i didn't know um but you know when your mind's telling you the future is going to be horrendous if you can counter that with the question well do you absolutely know that to be true great work there's a lady called byron katie some of you in the us may have heard of her mm -hmm. um it's a great question to ask because you know if you ask you if you're thinking negative thoughts and you ask yourself the question do i absolutely know this to be true most of the time you have to say no do i absolutely know it to be true that i wouldn't make enough money to earn a living no i didn't absolutely know it. didn't know it absolutely to be true do i absolutely know it to be true that i'm going to fail as an entrepreneur and a businessman no i didn't know that to be absolutely true did i know it was absolutely true that we're going to get kicked out of the house because i can't pay the bills so all these things that was coming up with saying this may happen this may happen this may happen well when you challenge them all of course they could happen anything could happen the world could end in the next 10 minutes but they're not as believable. There's this little bit of space between how serious they pretend to be and how seriously you take them. And in that space, there's freedom. It sounds like that what mindfulness gave you was a sense of who you are in a context where everything was chaotic and changing. But, yeah. but that which was not changing was you. You are going to be the same person your last day at IBM and your first day without a job. You're going to be yeah. the same person. I mean, that's what I'm hearing you say. And I think that's, re that's really valuable. That's a I valuable see. lesson, not only for you to learn, and I've learned that too. I mean, that, that's why I can see it. Um, yeah. But it's also a lesson to, to give to other people. Because, yeah. you know, if, if anything, we've, in the last three years with COVID, everybody's gone through change everybody's in transition absolutely and no one knows what the future is right and and yet what i see is that and, and i wouldn't necessarily categorize this as mindfulness but people are beginning to to say i want to be aware of what what's going on around me i want to be aware of my life yeah which i think is another way of talking about mindfulness yeah absolutely and i would say something else to people because i know that there's been a lot of layoffs all over the world it's you know right. in the us and i would say that if you're if you're instinctively a warrior like i am if you're naturally somebody who worries you can only talk from personal experience and this isn't to, to to patronize anyone listening but i would say what was true for me is the thought of losing my job ed was worse than losing my job mm -hmm. because one the first one i can't do anything about that if i'm worrying about the possibility of me losing my job Unless I go and get another job, which I wouldn't wasn't doing, the only way I can fix that problem is to stop thinking about it, because it hasn't happened yet, and it may not happen, right? So in, in scenario A, I'm worrying that this may happen. The only way to counter that really is to stop thinking it, because it's a, it's a futile negative thought that you can't solve in this moment. It's like saying, "Am I going to catch COVID next week?" I'm going to do all the practical steps not to, but right. Whereas when it happens, when you get the phone call, you have been made redundant. Okay. So now you know what you're working with. You know, you plan. A, dozen, a dozen years ago, I, I began a, an 18 month, 20 month process where I had three losses. I lost all my clients, my, all my consulting clients. I took a job running a nonprofit here in the US and was fired after 18 months. And my marriage of 30 years ended. All those three things happened within about a year and a half. Wow. And um, and you know what? <laughs> In retrospect, that was the best thing that ever happened to me. Mm. Because it freed me. It was a it was a form of liberation. 
Because right. I was I was the same person. You, you know, if people, well, I, I don't want to characterize any of that, but I was the same person. I just was now free to figure out, okay, where am I going to go? I ended up moving to Wyoming and I spent almost six years here. And I wrote a book there. Yeah. And then when COVID started, I moved back to North Carolina, where I was from. And, you know, I'm continuing to going through these stages of transition. And, yeah. um, and, and so the, and so this is, I think part of what I'm learning, this is part of my, is that I, I need to create order. And order is not a rational thing. Order is, is seeing how all these parts of our lives fit together into something that's coherent. And when it's coherent, we know it like we were talking earlier about it. This is kind of embodied knowledge now. I am mm -hmm. all these things, and I don't really have to be conscious of all these things for all those things to be alive and active in my life. And and so that's that to me that's kind of how mindfulness becomes a, a way of life and not simply a technique, you know. Which I think is the the criticism of mindfulness, he, at least here in the states, is that this is just a technique for making yourself feel better. Well, yeah. it's that's not what it is. That, and obviously, what you're telling us that it's not is something much. Yeah, more. yeah. I wouldn't even tell you that it's not. I would say to people if you if you seriously want to answer that question try it and see what's true in your experience whenever i teach whenever i run keynotes i very often say the words please don't believe a word i tell you <laughs> in these entire eight weeks not because i'm a liar not because i'm not well trained not because i haven't done this a bunch of times but because believing in mindfulness will do nothing it won't change a damn thing in your life I can't believe that i can lie on my sofa eating junk food believing in fitness what good does it do me yeah. So, you know, it doesn't matter what mindfulness does for me or the greatest teachers in the world. It, the only thing that matters is what it does for you. And there's only one way to find that out. So tell us what you are doing um, with this in terms of program or that sort of thing, because I'm, I'm interested in, in in people finding out about you, not just your story, but maybe how they can reach out to you and, and maybe um, allow you to help them uh, gain mindfulness or help their business or whatever. I think that's what I that's what I'd like to hear uh, some for our guest uh, audience to hear from you. Yeah, I'd, I mean, I'd love to speak to people if they're interested in if they're interested in truly potentially transforming their workforce through mindfulness. They sound like huge words, don't they? But when I first started this, I remember saying to someone, you know, I might I'm either going to do this properly or I'm not going to do it. This can't be. This needs to be something that people are still practicing a year later. This can't be something where everybody falls off that cliff after the eight-week course. This has to just, we have to start to embed this. This has to be part of the culture of the organization. This needs to be part of something that's really going to grow its own legs and walk by itself after a while. And um, the two easiest ways of contacting me, one would be on LinkedIn. I'm very active on LinkedIn. If you just type in Steve Ware, W-A-R-E, mindfulness, mindfulness with one L, um, you'll find me on my website. It's just stevewaremindfulness.com. There's a contact form on there. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd love to help people. I've got a real passion about helping the world kind of one business at a time. You know, whoever wants this, if people are open to it, and it's absolutely optional, I never try and force people to join my courses, listen to my keynotes, do anything. But if you're open to it and if it resonates with you, I mean, if if you've listened to this podcast and you're kind of nodding and thinking, yeah, that's me, this makes a lot of sense, then a, then a course would probably be ideal. And, and this is what I want to say. I want to say this to the audience that if if coming out of COVID has been that that whole experience was really devastating for you and you feel that you don't know where your life is and you don't know where it's going. I think what Steve is offering is, is a place to start to kind of bring some order back to your life and get some focus on the future that's positive. And I think I mean, this is what he's doing, and um, and in the stories that he's told me outside of this this conversation here, you know, it it, it I, I'm convinced that what he's doing is really, um, really helpful to people. And I know people who have been through a lot hard times who I think need to hear what you have to to say and offer the services that you offer. So, yeah, thank you. It's very powerful stuff. You know, I don't, I don't. Um... That's not me blowing smoke up myself. This is mindfulness is an incredible, it's, an, it's probably the most powerful thing I've ever practiced. 
Well, it's like you've been given a gift that you're also giving away. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, that's the best thing about being part of the human community is that we, we are giving things and then we can give them away because uh, we, we want other people to benefit from the things that we've benefited from. It's a great feeling. Yeah, it is. Well, thank you, Steve, for being with us. This has been great. I just, you know, I just, I just have this, um, this sense of how many people can find something for their lives that they have been missing and maybe missing for 30 years or more. Oh yeah. Because they have been trying to overthink and they're not simply being mindful and connected to their bodies and, and all those things. So, so thank you. Thank you for coming on and thank you everyone for uh, watching. Please subscribe and hit the like button, but even more so offer your comments and ask the questions that maybe um, will be helpful in you uh, finding something new for yourself. Enter into conversation with us and uh, we'll be glad to be in conversation with you. So we'll see you next time. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, everyone. And we'll see you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.